you know, if it was actually dark. And lo and behold, I realized that I could see light coming from the bottom of the blindfold. Gonzo, the Coast Guard years, Key West, episode 10, Egress and Frozen Fish. So I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but eventually we moved out of the Navy barracks and onto the boat. Now, most Coasties call their ship, their boat, a boat. Even though technically the Thetis was a ship, we almost always refer to our ship as our boat. Now, the way it was explained to me that if a vessel is 65 feet and bigger, it was a ship. If it was less than 65 feet, it was a boat. Now, I'm sure there's probably some more technical things about that, but that's how it was explained to me. Uh, So anyway, um, but you'll almost always hear me refer to it as the boat because that's, I mean, literally, that's what we all called it, even though technically it was a ship. So the deck department, which the department that I was in, uh, we had our birthing area aft back. Ah, fuck. I mean, back aft. Yeah, that's what I meant. Back aft. And the only way to get to it, I mean, not the only, but the easiest way to get to it um, was from the fantail, which is the back of the ship, the outside back of the ship. And to get to it, you needed to go through one of the big door hatch things. Actually, you went through two door hatch things. But usually on, a, on the ship or boat, when you're underway, before you could open up the second hatch, you had to close the first one. Um, so if you were with somebody else, you know, that person, the last one that comes through the hatch from the outside, needed to close that before you're allowed to open the next one. However, that rarely ever happened that way, um, especially in port. In port, the inner hatches were almost always open. That rule was really only applied underway, but it probably should have applied all the time. When you get past the second hatch and you turn to the left uh just a little bit past the hatch or to the port for you nautical people uh was the ladder that went down to uh the birthing area now one of the things that you're that you learn to do or you have to do especially on a new ship was learn how to egress or to egress from your birthing area while blindfolded now i'm not even sure why they call it a birthing area I was told that a berth is a bed on a boat or a ship. Uh, I don't know about you and the rest of the world, but it was just a fucking bed. A super uncomfortable bed, but it was a bed, it, which really was more like a big coffin. Oh, it was terrible. Um, yeah, I, yeah, man, I'll talk more about that later, about sleeping one of those damn things. But they were a freaking mess. Uh, so you, you had an egress, and basically that was emergency escape something. I'm sure egress actually has a more, you know, convoluted uh, explanation for what the word actually means. But you needed to egress or escape out of there blindfolded. And you needed to do that in case, like, there was um, the ship was on fire and there was smoke in the, in the birthing area and you couldn't see. Or even if the emergency lights seemed to fail. Uh, so if, if, if the ship's power goes, these other... Emergency lanterns come on. Now, I'm telling you, if those lanterns don't come on, you're basically fucked. Uh, But anyway, but you need to figure out how to get out of there. Anyway, you had to learn how to evacuate. Now, as I mentioned that um, as we are back at, as you you go down the ladder to get into into the birthing area, the, the, the first thing you come across is you go into the ship's or the birthing area locker room. Now, the locker room basically was there, there was a. There's a locker for every rack or bunk in the actual birthing area. So there were three doors um, in there. One of them was the door to, um, I mean, you you go down the ladder and you're, and you're there with all the lockers and the lockers uh, essentially were big enough to hang some uniforms and some personal belongings. I mean, they weren't, they were tall, but not very wide. So not a lot of room, but, most of us didn't actually have a lot of stuff, so it, it, it didn't really matter so much. So in addition to that, in addition to the, the locker room, there was a door to our lounge area. And that lounge area was ridiculously small. 
And I mean, I'll admit, I wasn't too crazy about a lot of the folks or or not a lot. I said, there's a few folks I did not like in the deck department. But the weird thing is, though, it was, it was really crazy. We would, like I said, there's 21 of us. And about half of us would figure out how to pile into this tiny little room so we could watch television together. And we're like piled on top of each other. The The couch that they had there probably would fit, you know, four normal sized people. We would squeeze like six or seven onto it. And then people would sit on like a little table we had there and like little, so it was, you had guys like legs on top of legs. And anyway, it was really crazy. Uh, we were a s- severely weird, dysfunctional little family. So th- there's another door in that little locker space that led to the bathroom or the head, again, for you nautical people. And I'm not even sure why they called it a head, because we were clearly not at the head of the ship, which is like the bow. And again, there's a whole reason why they call the bathroom the head. I think I mentioned that before, but eh, maybe we'll get into it a bit later if I remember. Then there was the door to the birthing area, which is where the actual bunks were. Oh, no, 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 wait. So there was another door. It was a sealed door. I think it had like a big lock on it. So that door was almost directly behind the ladder and between the, the head and between the door to get to the little lounge area. And the weird thing is, it was the JP5 pump room. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. So yeah, there's another door. Now, for those of you who don't know, JP5 is aviation fuel. It's the fuel that they use for the helos that would be deployed with the ship. Uh, the Thetis didn't have a helo at this time. Uh, that was something that would happen you know, long after I had left the ship. All Coast Guard 270s have a helo deployed to them at one point, so I'm sure they did. And they actually had something a little special on the Thetis that uh, I think it was the only ship to have it in this class of vessels. But here's the thing. We slept right next to a shit ton of highly explosive fuel. This is jet fuel. Stuff you put into airplanes and, you know, like fighter jets and helicopters and like big jumbo planes. JP, this stuff is really explosive. I'm like, what the fuck were these shit builders thinking? I mean, really? Why would you put something so explosive, so dangerous next to where people sleep? I mean, if that pump room or the aviation fuel exploded, you would kill nearly a quarter of the ship's crew. I mean, what the fuck? Anyway, okay, so I'm just telling you that stuff like that really bothered me. And I'm sure it bothered a lot of other folks, but probably me more than most. Um... You're in the birthing area and uh, the, the place smelled like sweaty old socks that died. And then someone grabbed them, put them on again, threw them in a corner, and then those socks died again. So it's like, you know, double smelly. And it's here where 21 dudes, you know, slept. However, rarely were there 21 people ever in there sleeping. Once we were all sleeping on the ship... There was usually four or five that were up standing watch somewhere, but not at all times. So it really depended whether if you're underway, you have more people on watch. If you um, in the deck department, if you're in port, you had fewer people because you need a fewer people. Uh, except for like the mid watch and the four to eights. Uh, I think there's even fewer than if you are underway, uh, I mean, not underway, but if you were in port, like one person for the four to eights and one person for the mids. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm all over the place. Anyway. So in this area, the, the, the bunks were stacked three high and the, each one of them had rack curtains and the, the curtains were blue and, and they were they were tiny little curtains that went the length of your, your, your rack. Now, they did too, they did do a pretty good job, you know, providing some privacy, but they really only served two purposes. They'd block out some of the light when if, if you were trying to sleep because they had we had these red lights that would come on at night. And the red lights were almost always on. So with these little rack, these blue rack curtains, they did block out some of that light. And if you were on the uh, mid watch, you got to sleep in till, um, you know, technically they said 10 o'clock, but you're always up way before that. The rack curtains help keep the lights out when everybody else was getting up. And of course, uh, if you were one of those people that or dudes that was foolhardy enough to try, 
A few folks would sit there and, you know, whack off, jerk off, spank the monkey, strangle the weasel, or whatever you want to call it. But some dudes would do that. Now, if you're one of those folks who used the rat curtains for that purpose, you were certainly to be caught at some point. I mean, seriously, it was going to happen. You were going to get caught. Someone was going to walk by and hear you, you know, taking care of business or something. And no, I was not one of those people. I no, 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 um, no, no, hell no. But when but people who did get caught, they got harassed nonstop. And it was like, that's it. There was no way around it. This was going to be your life of harassment on the ship. So anyway, totally digressing here, but so there's 21 dudes to sleep in this room, and we all, Tons each of one of us, had Coast to Guard take years. this egress PUS, training. Episode 10. They gave you, egress like, and I'm pretty frozen sure fish. it was like a blindfold they put on me. And so, the, you know, they, so they covered your eyes, and I'm just inside the door in the birthing area, and it was like the BM2, the BM3. I think they were both there. So they would spin you in a circle, you know, to help disorient you so you don't know which way you're facing. Believe me, if you were hungover when they were doing that, ooh, good Lord. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure that would have been bad. Once they get you turned around, again, it was supposed to disorient you, and so what it was like to be in complete darkness. The lights are out. The emergency lights are out. There's smoke in the compartment. You can't see. Now you got to find your way out. Here's my thing. If there was smoke in the compartment and the lights went out, the power went out, and it happened all at once, and you had... 20 other dudes trying to get out the same door that you, that was never going to happen. There'd be 20 guys crawling all over each other, beating each other up to get out the door, then to turn the corner and run up the ladder. That was never, that is, you know what? Another fucking disaster that was going to happen. Someday, some way, it was going to happen. So they blindfold my ass, they spin me around, and when they stopped spinning, or would stop spinning me, um, it, you know, it took me a minute or two or three to get my bearing. And you know when someone, like, you cover your eyes, you know, the first thing you do is you close your eyes when your eyes get covered. So I did the same thing. But with the blindfold on, I opened my eyes to see if I could, you know, if it was actually dark. And lo and behold, I realized that I could see light coming from the bottom of the blindfold. And I was like, holy shit, I can actually see my shoes. Hot damn. They, so they put the blindfold on not very well. And of course, when they said, can I see? I said, no, I can't see a fucking thing. I said, yes. So maybe I um, took advantage of the situation a little bit, but um, I still couldn't see very well, but I could see my, I could barely see my toes. But, you know, just like anything else, I'm figuring you know, I, I, I need to take advantage of this. I tip my head back a little bit, which I'm sure was a giveaway. And I squatted down to the floor and reached out because if you tip your head back, I can, you know, it's almost like looking forward a little bit. And I could see you know, like the bulkhead. I knew I was like right by the door. Uh, so they didn't do a good job spinning me around. So I put my hand out, I grabbed the bulkhead and I shimmied, you know, like, you know, kind of like a weird duck walk or something like that. I got to the door. I, and again, I could see the edge of the door. I reached up, I grabbed the doorknob, I opened it up. And now I'm just like, you know, hugging the wall, pretending that I was really getting into this stuff. But I, once I was past the door and um, I knew right away, you turn right out and there's a set of lockers next to me and so I just kept going and with my head tipped back I could see the edge of the ladder so I reached up grabbed the ladder and of course at that point I just stood up and just sort of walked up it's like I can see my toes so I wasn't going to sit there and trip on these fucking you know death metal ladders oh death metal ladders well, that should be a band name but anyway okay so I get to the top I take off my blindfold and I'm like woohoo and the, here's the funny thing about it. These people knew something was up because the BM2 said, did you cheat? I'm like, oh, no, of course I didn't cheat. I'm just good. I knew what I was doing. 
it kind of pressed me a little bit, um, but it was sort of in a joking manner, but maybe he was serious. I don't know. But I'm like, no, 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 no. I couldn't see a thing. You know, I just, you know, I'm just good at this or something like that. As it turns out, they kind of thought I was like some, you know, super ninja or something because I got out faster than anybody. I mean, I did. I could see. So, of course, I got out faster than everybody else. It's like a miracle. There's a whole lot of shit uh, in addition to the egress training that goes on into preparing a ship to get underway. One of those things that one of the things that they do is uh, when you especially when you're leaving the ship, you already got a shit ton of stuff to prepare um, the ship for getting underway for the first time with a full crew or mostly a full crew. You need food, you need to get food on the ship. And so somewhere in the bowels of the ship, there's a real big ass freezer. And so I only saw this freezer once. Uh, which is probably a good thing. Uh, I couldn't even tell you after being there that one time how to actually get back to this freezer. I remember that standing in front of this big ass freezer where the where a lot of the food was going to be uh, above you, there were there was a big ass square hatch. I mean, it was huge, and I think right above that there was another hatch. Pretty sure that was it. Yeah, my recollection is pretty pretty bad on this. Um, in addition to this big ass freezer down below, there was a big ass freezer truck on the pier with all this food. The Coast Guard, and I'm sure like a lot of other services, have this efficient way of moving stuff that can be carried by a human being. Uh, so it's not too heavy. I, I, I'm sure there's some like magic number in pounds that um, requires a two-man lift versus a one-man lift or a person. But it's a human conveyor belt. Basically, you just line up a bunch of people, you know, X number of feet apart, all the way till you get to, you know, where you're going to put down whatever it is you're carrying. I'm down below, and there's a few of us down below, not a lot of us. But of course, I figured being down below was a safe place to be because I wouldn't actually have to, you know, carry a lot or move a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, I was fucking wrong. It was a, it, it, it was a hot mess down there, but this freezer truck is getting offloaded sort of willy nilly. The frozen food is starting to stack up on the flight deck and, um, frozen food on the flight deck. And I think this was still like, we were late spring at this point, I think going on late spring in, um, in the shipyard. No, man, what the hell was it? Yeah, it was late spring. So food's starting to pile up. And, and and the reason it was piling up was because down below, some of the ship's cooks were having to or stack and organize um, that frozen food in a way so later on they can pull it all out as they need it. So it needed to be well organized and sort of put there in a logical fashion. The problem is, like I said, they were pulling that shit off uh, the frozen food out of the truck all willy-nilly and stuff and just stacking it up. And so this is, of course, we were backing up down below. We had boxes all over the place of frozen food, like around our feet in front of this freezer. And this is where the poo started hitting the fan. On the Thetis, and this might be up with other Coast Guard ships or ships in general, Friday was fish day. So fish Friday. I'm pretty sure this was like a religious thing that I never quite understood. But generally speaking, we always had fish Friday. I was not a fish fan. And this is where the problem with the whole this this, this whole thing is. This fish is a hot it was a hot day for Newport, Rhode Island. Frozen fish was being left out on this deck. And when you have um a bunch of coasties we're not thinking. Someone says, take this box and stack it. And so we're just taking boxes and we're stacking it. I'm down below and boxes are coming down. I don't care what they are. I'm just stacking in a corner with a couple of other dudes. Cooks are trying to put the stuff in the, in the freezer. And then, I mean, there's a huge fucking backup of shit going on. And then, then if things weren't getting a little, uh, weren't bad enough because we were backing up, the head cook, the chief cook comes down. Now, this dude was your typical salty 
Coast Guard chief. He was loud. He was old. Had a big bushy ass mustache that I'm sure did not meet Coast Guard regulations. He had one of those old man flat wide asses and a big ass gut. I mean, he was the epitome of heart attack waiting to happen. And I remember he was kind of tall too. He was, I mean, he was that guy, that old dude that you would just, you'd always see him just standing around with a, you know, with a, uh, a coffee mug, you know, rocking back and forth like a shit didn't stink. In the Coast Guard, it was, that was almost true. If you were a chief, you, you, you were basically like God. Nobody could fuck with you and because you knew your shit. Chiefs were the bomb uh, and they knew everything, or at least we thought they knew everything when it came to their job. They were more experienced. They were grownups. When most of us are in our early 20s, these chiefs are all in their, you know, their 30s, mid, late 30s. Although there were a few chiefs that were pretty young uh, and that was um, that, that was a rarity. But anyway, this dude comes down and he is like completely f- fucking nuts. I'm not exactly sure who the other cooks were that were in the big, huge freezer, but this chief lit into them. He was cussing and screaming all because, not all because, the, the, the fish that was sitting on the flight deck was starting to thaw out. I mean, the chief was yelling at everyone. He kept screaming to only bring the fish down. We didn't have any control of the, what was going on because it's whatever the people up, up top were sending down below. Oh my God, that reminds me of a movie, something about, um, anyway, okay, okay, whatever. We had no control over that. And the way he was reacting, you, you, th- you would think he was about to start punching somebody. He was grabbing boxes out of our hands, like really, like, in a vicious way, throwing him across the thing, throwing him into the, the, the locker or the, the, the locker, the, the, the big ass Fraser throwing it at the cooks to grab their shit. It was fucking crazy. And all along, the cooks are like trying to stack shit and the chiefs up there freaking out. We're in there freaking out because they were stacking it wrong and they couldn't do this right. They couldn't do that right. So he's just throwing boxes around. I mean, the place was a fucking mess. He keeps screaming that the fish was ruined. He's throwing, it was just, he was throwing shit everywhere. And the weird thing is, like, I, I, I was scared. I was scared. I wasn't the only one that was scared, though, because I was pretty sure that the chief was eventually going to hit somebody. What he ended up doing was he kept slapping or hitting the bulkhead and screaming, God damn it, fuck, the fish is ruined. I mean, he was just really angry. And I, I was sure that the next thing he hit was going to be one of us. Or probably one of the cooks in the freezer. That's what I'm sure he was really pissed at. Occasionally when the chief would like go into the um, the big ass freezer to move stuff. One or two of the other crew members that was down there with me. And there might have been like three or four of us or five. I don't remember. But they escaped. And it's probably a good thing that they did escape. Because I think what they went to do is they went and got help. Because just before... I thought the chief, I don't know, I don't know. But but, but before the chief completely went ballistic, one of the coolest dudes that I ever met, or coolest officers that I ever met in the Coast Guard appeared. He was our executive officer, the second in charge of the ship. Uh, But you basically, you just called him XO. Uh, That's how you always referred to him. He was a lieutenant commander. Uh, You never called him lieutenant commander. You didn't even call him Mr. So-and-so. You just called him XO. And I think that was pretty much how the entire Coast Guard was. You always referred to him as XO. I mean, if you were introducing him to like your parents, you might say, this is, you know, uh, Lieutenant Commander Oopfudabump. He's he's our executive officer. I remember he was a tall, really lean guy with a big bushy mustache, too which he, that was probably also barely Coast Guard regulation. Um, but when he showed up, the, the mood changed. And he walked up to the chief cook 
and he kind of pulled him aside, but you know, we're all watching because, you know, it's like, holy shit, what's going to happen here? But the EXO was really chill. It was like watching like the whole, like Mr. Hyde turning back into Dr. Jekyll. I mean, Chief's attitude changed completely. And if you don't know who Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are, um, if you don't get that reverence, you need to go sit somewhere in a corner quietly and contemplate your life choices. You should know who Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are. It's a classic. Don't ask me who wrote it, because I don't remember. So clearly I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. I never said I was smart, but I am pretty. Anyway, I stole that line from somewhere else. And uh, maybe one day somebody will figure that out. So anyway. We all heard the 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 EXO when well, he was kind of whispering. They were trying to keep the conversation to themselves, but he he told the chief he needed to calm down because that was it was reported that he was a acting like a total fucking whack job. So I'm kind of paraphrasing that just a little bit, but you get the gist of the conversation. The the EXO told him he needed to calm down, but I got why the chief was having a complete you know fucking meltdown. If the sh- fish went bad and people ate it, then it would be the chief's fault. And that's a big deal because feeding the crew not only is it necessary so we can do our jobs, but, you know, it helped with morale. You had good food. You were you you were going to probably do good stuff. And if shit was bad, well, you know how that goes. You don't want bad shit happening. Now, I don't know if anyone ever got sick from the fish. Why don't I know? Well, I never ate the fucking fish, and I I guess I really never paid attention to anybody else getting sick on the ship. So when Fridays came around, I just probably had a little less to eat than somebody else, or I probably just took something else off somebody else's tray, shit they didn't want, you know, like spinach or kale or something. I don't know. But, yeah. Yeah. I don't remember anyone getting sick from the fish. And besides, on Fridays, when we were in port, if there was some place else to be on a Friday, you went and did that. So if I didn't eat a lot on the on the ship, I would try to get something else off the ship. While I was in the Coast Guard, this happened like all the time anyway on, uh, I mean, Fish Fridays. So when we were underway, uh, that, that kind of sucked. I was limited on uh, what I could eat. But I never ate the fish. I mean, never ate the fish because it was frozen and it could have been spoiled uh, because it was left out in the pier and the flight deck for hours. But speaking of getting sick, it leads me um, to the last night of us being in Newport, Rhode Island. Well, I didn't mention a whole lot about him, uh, but there's a guy named Seaman Jackson. He's the one that I would... Uh, him and um, Dan and I had the, the tobacco in in um, in Newport in the barracks. That made me sick, but this is another sick thing. Not that it's sick, but you'll, you'll get it. Anyway, so so while we were there, Jackson had met some girl who was of legal age, and Dan was of legal age. Jackson was of legal age. I, however, was 19 or 20 at the time, and um, but somehow... She managed to get all of us into this club. Now, I don't remember a whole lot about what happened at this club. What I do remember, though, was that I had a whole bunch of rum and cokes, uh, like a fuck ton of rum and coke. And so I, yeah, I drank a lot of that. And I, and so I don't remember a, a whole hell of a lot, but I do have some recollections of what happened the next day or the next evening because the next day the ship got underway and left the shipyards in Newport, Rhode Island. And we were headed down to good old Curtis Bay, Maryland, which is where the Coast Guard shipyards were, leaving one shipyard that we spent two months at to go to another one where we're going to spend the next four months at. So, I don't remember the ship casting off from Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, What I do remember is that I woke up 
sometime, you know, around 11-ish p.m. that day, because some fucking idiot woke me up while this idiot asshole was actually doing their job. I don't know if anyone told me, or I guess I just should have known, or what, I, I don't remember. But I was being woken up for the mid-watch, so that's like midnight to 4 a.m. in the morning, which was really like 11.45 or 23.45 p.m. to 03.45 a.m. or in the morning. The thing is, as you can imagine, Based on the um, shit ton of rum and cokes that I had, I was really hungover. The thing is, when someone wakes you up from a sound sleep and it's like that late at night, um, come on. For those of you who have teenagers, you know that they're just when they're tired, we're just we're just mean and grumpy and disrespectful, and you know we hate everybody. That was me, except I was hungover. So. I'm not entirely sure again of like the whole sort of chain of events. What did happen was though, is that the next thing you know, I am standing in front of the ship's helm uh, and it's in the middle of the night and it's dark. You can't see outside. It's, you can hear the water splashing as a ship's, you know, moving through the water, but there are some, there's red lights, you know, on the ship. So you can see sort of, um, but not again, it's all kind of, dim to me and they put me in front of the 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 helm and i mean there's like knobs and switches and these big huge handles that apparently were the throttle and there's just a whole lot of stuff going on and none of it made sense to me and and instead of there like so i i get there and i'm expecting like this big huge wheel like you see in the movies you know to turn the ship no there's no wheel. What they have is this joystick that's like attached to the console that I'm standing in front of, and the joystick moves horizontally left and right. Um, there's no wheel, which is probably a good thing because I hadn't driven a car in months. So I'm sure I was a little bit rusty, and you can imagine how rusty I would be if I was trying to drive a ship with a big old wheel. So as it turns out, That as I'm standing in front of this thing, this joystick at the helm, one of the ship's quartermasters is also with me. And uh, a quartermaster is basically one of the ship's navigators. And I forgot this particular quartermaster's name, but he had a a striking resemblance to a one Father Guido Sarducci. Now, that is a character from a late night Saturday evening show that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Maybe not the character, but Father Guido Sarducci. That's what this guy looked like. He had the, the bushy mustache and he always wore like the glasses. And yeah, he looked, he, he, yeah, he looked like that dude. Anyway, I'm sure I mentioned before that everyone assumed that I knew more than I actually did. I mean, I never told anybody that I knew stuff. I mean, I, I don't know seamanship shit. I, I, I still don't know where they got that impression from. But Father Guido Sarducci also fell into this category thinking that I knew a lot more. I don't know why they thought I was some salty dog, because I was not. But he had asked, had had I ever steered a ship like this? And I'm like, of course not. I have no no idea. So he's like, okay, cool. I'm going to cover the basics. And the basics were like, he's like, you see that big thing in the middle? That's the ship's gyro compass. We're headed on a course of, I don't know, it's like 240 degrees, which is basically, you know, south, southwest. So anyway, he said, we're going to head in that direction. And then there was something else that he said, and I'm not 100% sure um, that if I got off course more than three degrees, I was to let him know, like, right away. Um, of course, that, that there are, like, specific protocols on how you communicate on the bridge. And I assure you, I didn't know any of them. So as I'm, I'm again, it's sometime after midnight at this point, and I'm steering the ship with this joystick, it, this 270 foot long ship. I mean, I mean, it's not big compared to a Navy ship, but this is humongous for me. I have the foggiest idea. And I was nervous. I was scared. I was 
hungover as shit. And apparently I was not just hungover, but I was seasick as well. And uh, it was like a big old fucking double whammy. And Father Guido Sarducci saw me leaning over um, the joystick and holding on to like a little, there's like a, a rail in front of where I was standing, like about waist height. And I'm holding on to that. And clearly I was drifting off course. It's like, uh, if you looked at the back of the ship, you could swear I was trying to draw a zigzag pattern in the ocean, which apparently was what you're not supposed to do. Now, this might have happened for like two or three minutes. And then, you know, you know, Father Sarducci walks up and says, you're out. And then he he takes the helm from me. He tells me I should go out and get some air and he he'll steer for a while. And here's the thing. I never came back. I went straight to my rack, went back aft to the ship. And I, I don't know if I threw up or anything like that. I just know I went right back to my rack, hung over, and I'm seasick. And I don't remember shit until the next morning before we pull into port. And I'm still hung over. The BM2, I remember this conversation. It's like a dream, but I remember having this conversation the next morning with him. He came up to me, pulled me aside, and just trying to be, you know, real professional about this. And um, he basically read me the riot act for going back to my bunk and that he something about that if I was going to continue being a leading seaman that I needed to pull my shit together. And I remember thinking, first off, motherfucker, I never asked to be a leading seaman, but I know I was also thinking, but um, not like I didn't want to be the leading a leading seaman because, you know, that's it was a little bit of power, a little bit of influence. And he also mentioned something, too, that he knew I was hung over because he could smell it. And you know what I'm talking about. That smell that you have on your breath and the stuff, you know, oozing out of your pores from a long night of reckless, albeit really fun night of drinking. You've been listening to Guns of the Coast Guard Years Key West, written and produced by Tim Gonzalez. And I'm Nicholas Gonzalez, the voice guy. Join us next week for another episode of Gonzo the Coast Guardiers.